Hey there, my name is Joe Barnard, and today we're going to go all the way from getting your Signal Alpha kit to flying the model rocket with it. So first, we'll start by unboxing. On the top, we've got our BPS stickers. These can go on a rocket or anything else. We've also got the TVC cutout guides and the flight computer guides. Under this piece of paper, we have our most important component, which is the Signal Alpha flight computer. After that, we have a couple of bags with smaller components, like a hex wrench, some push rods, and M3.5 millimeter screws. Then we have our main components of the TVC mount. These are the inner gimbal and the outer gimbal. After that, we have a bag with a motor mount tube, some servos, and some TVC extension cables. And lastly, we have our flight computer mounting brackets. These hold the computer inside the rocket. At the bottom of the box, you'll also find a little card that details how most of this packaging was used with eco-friendly materials and is recyclable. Before we jump into things, you'll want to follow along using the Signal Alpha user manual. You can download this at bps.space slash build signal alpha. For this first part, you're going to need the Signal Alpha fly computer, as well as the mounting brackets for the computer, and some M3.5 screws in the 12 millimeter length. Open up the flight computer as well as the mounting brackets and pull out four of the M3.5 12 millimeter screws. We're gonna to wanna to pay attention to the side text on these mounting brackets. Some of the text is upright, some of it is upside down, and when mounted correctly, they will correspond with the upwards direction of the rocket. It should be a pretty snug fit against the PCB. That's okay for now. We need the stars facing forward or the front direction of the rocket, uh, which will be the same direction as the signal alpha text on the computer. Grab those 12 millimeter screws and put them in the four holes in the four corners of the flight computer. This is also gonna be a snug fit. Um, so if it's a little bit hard to screw in, that's okay. The next thing we're going to need is a power source for the flight computer. I use an 11.1 volt LiPo, but you can also use a 9 volt or any power source that is above 7 volts, which is where the voltage regulator drops out. Um, I also like to put some rubber bands around the flight computer. This is going to help us secure the battery to the computer so that it doesn't shake around the rocket during flight. You'll also need a connector with exposed leads for the battery. It's not a good idea to connect the battery directly to the flight computer in case you want to remove it for charging or any other purpose. Be super careful here about uh, wiring up the red and black to the correct leads. There's a plus and minus on the flight computer. You don't want to wire it backwards. Uh, Signal does have backwards voltage protection, but it's just a good idea to not do it because it won't turn on. So go ahead and put the battery in those rubber bands. Make sure it doesn't move around too much um, and then hook it up to your connector. At this point, you can go ahead and turn the flight computer on using that little power switch. It should beep a couple of times and then give you an error message. This noise means we are missing an SD card, uh, so we'll take care of that next. On the build signal alpha page, there's a file named config1.txt. You're going to download this and put it onto the root of your micro SD card. If you want to open it up and take a look around, this is the file that tells your computer what to do during flight. All of the settings themselves are at the top of the file and the descriptions of how they work and what they do are at the bottom. Go ahead and close that, eject the card, and we're going to put it in the flight computer. I also find it helpful to move the rubber band over the SD card, which will help keep it mounted during flight. Go ahead and turn the computer on and let it start up. Once you see the green with the beeps, you know your computer is good to go. Now it's time to build the motor mounts. We're going to start with the innermost part, which is the actual motor tube. This is just going to need a small linkage stopper connected to it, and that's what we'll get out of this small components bag. For reference, this is the linkage stopper right here, and it's going to go into the tiniest hole of the motor mount. The fit between these two things is going to be very snug initially, so I find it helpful to use it almost as a bit with my drill here. It's okay if the hole is stripped a little bit. We want this thing to turn, and friction will hold it in for the most part. Once you've done that, you're all set. You just need a section of cardboard motor tube. This is gonna go in between the motor and this plastic mount and act as a liner to mitigate the heat created by your motor during flight. Now it's time to assemble the inner gimbal. First, we're gonna take these parts out of their bags and we're gonna remove the support material with some pliers from the inner gimbal. 
This should be pretty easy to do, and if you've ordered it from BPS, it'll be really easy to take off and should come off all in one piece. Make sure you look around the whole part to catch any pieces of support material that might be hiding. Then you're also going to use a uh, little screwdriver or something like that to remove the support material that's inside those screw holes. Go ahead and grab the smaller M3.5 screws, you just need two of them for this part, and slide the inner gimbal over the motor mount. Then you can use those screws to attach the motor mount and the inner gimbal together. Again, the fit between these two things should be pretty snug. If the two parts don't rotate together freely, that's okay at first. Open up the small components bag and take out the push rod that has only one bend in it. You'll also need a servo for this part. Counting from the screw in the middle of the servo horn, count one, two, three holes away and attach the push rod to that hole. Grab two of the very tiny screws from the small components bag. You'll also want to grab that 1.5 millimeter hex wrench. With the servo cable and horn facing down, attach the servo to the inner gimbal. Using those two very small screws, we're going to attach the servo to the inner gimbal. As with basically everything in this tutorial, the fit between these two things should be very snug. Okay, looking good. Now we're going to use the 1.5mm hex wrench, unscrew that linkage stopper just a little bit, and thread the push rod through the two holes in it. Once our motor mount and servo horn seem to be parallel with one another, we're going to tighten down that linkage stopper with the 1.5mm hex wrench. Make sure this is really tight because we don't want this coming loose. Now it's time to attach the outer gimbal to the inner gimbal. Using the same process as last time, we're going to get rid of the support material. First we'll get the big chunks, and then we'll get the small bits inside these holes with that little screwdriver. Grab both pieces, and first pay attention to where the stars are on the outer gimbal and the inner gimbal. In the same manner as the flight computer, these need to line up for everything to work correctly. Once you've got them lined up, slide the outer gimbal onto the top of the inner gimbal. It should snap in and be, again, kind of a snug fit. Using the smaller M3.5 screws, you can go ahead and attach the outer gimbal to the inner gimbal. As with before, it's okay if these don't rotate super easily. Now we're going to grab the push rod with several bends in it, as well as two of those very small screws and another servo. This next part is a little bit tricky. You want to take this specific end of the bent push rod and thread it through the tiny hole in the top of the inner gimbal. This is a little bit tough because you'll probably need to use pliers to get it to go through easily, and you don't want to break that top part of the inner gimbal. At this point, it's basically a running joke, but you guessed it, it should be a snug fit. Once it's bent like so and can rotate freely in that axis, we're going to attach the servo. Again, in the same manner as before, you're going to count one, two, three holes from the center of the servo horn, and then thread the push rod through it. Push the servo cable into the inside of the gimbal here, we want it to be closer to the motor mount rather than further away. Then slide the servo into that spot. We'll use those two very tiny screws to secure it first on the top and then on the bottom. The bottom screw can be a little tricky to insert, so sometimes using a magnetic screwdriver can help. Our last step here is to thread the bottom servo cable up through the top so it's somewhat enclosed between the push rod and the motor mount. Once you've done this, we're ready to wire the whole thing up. Before we get things wired up, we want to make sure they're very clearly labeled. You'll see on the inner gimbal, there's an indicator that says Y pointing towards the bottom servo. We're going to take that black part on the end of the cable and label it Y with a silver sharpie. You're going to do the same with the opposite servo, which is the X servo, and that's labeled on the outer gimbal this time. Take the extension cables out of that little bag, and we're going to label those too. It doesn't matter which one you pick, but just make sure it's consistent between the top and bottom of the cable. One should be X, and the other should be Y. This may seem a bit overkill, but it's important to do because it's rocket science, and we want to make sure we're doing this stuff correctly. Now it's time to connect the extension cables. Make sure the white lines up with the orange, the red lines up with the red, and the brown lines up with the black. Do this for both of the cables. Now you'll want to line up the ends of the TVC extension cables. These are the ones with the white part. There's going to be a little bit more slack in one of these cables than the other. Loop this cable around itself here, and then we're going to tape it up. It's important to get rid of the slack because any extra cabling could end up in a TVC jam, which is really bad because if your rocket relies on TVC to stay upright, you're going to have a bad flight. 
Wrap these cables tightly in a generous amount of tape, and you're good to go. Paying close attention to the X and Y labeling on the flight computer, it's time to plug in the extension cables. The X cable goes into the X port, the Y cable goes into the Y port. Make sure the white part of the cable is facing up and you're all set. It's time to get our hardware alignment dialed in. Put the SD card into your computer, open up the configuration file, and switch the TVC hardware alignment mode from a 0 to a 1. This will turn the mode on, save the file, eject the card, and let's put it in our flight computer. Once you've inserted the card, you can go ahead and turn on the flight computer. You're going to hear a beep, and then you should see a blue flashing light. This function is used to make sure the mount is calibrated correctly. We'll use it again later once the rocket is fully built, but for now, it's just helpful to get familiar with these different modes. You can go ahead and turn off the flight computer, eject the card, and it's time to put it in party mode. We'll do this by opening up the configuration file again. Once it's open, we first want to turn off the hardware calibration mode since we don't need to use it anymore. We'll switch it from a 1 to a 0. Then, scrolling down towards the bottom of the settings, we'll switch party mode from a 0 to a 1. There are actually seven different party modes, but we'll just use the first for now. After saving, eject the card, and we'll put it back in the flight computer. Once the computer is turned on, some lights will flash, you'll hear some beeps, and the TVC mount will actuate plus and minus 5 degrees on each axis. Not only is this kind of a fun mode, it's actually a useful feature. If your mount isn't working well, usually you'll see that one axis moves slower than the other, or there's a jam somewhere. 